Hello, I'm John Fitch, MIT science reporter. We're at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory in Lexington, Massachusetts. It has also seen the beginning of the computer era and has made many important contributions to it. A man actually talking to a computer in a way far different than it's ever been possible to do before. He's going to be talking graphically. He's going to be drawing the graphical language that we call Sketchpad that started with Ivan Sutherland some years ago when he was busy working on his doctoral degree. Hello everyone. I found these videos the other day of, of one of the first ever times that graphics were ever seen in computers. And this was the first time in a practical sense. The practicality of it being that you could design anything really using what we call now as non-destructive editing where you can go back and change anything at any time and everything is reversible. Everything is dynamic. So I saw these videos and I thought, you know, I'm going to share some of the parts that stuck out to me. And after I show you a few clips of these videos, I'm going to show you how I designed my Zeiss Music logo in a modern 3D application called Blender. And you will see that we have come a very, very long way since Sketchpad, but it is still extremely interesting and I hope you enjoy it. We're at the TX2 console at Lincoln Lab. This machine, a large computer, it was built by Lincoln Lab in 1956 as a, a research machine. Now how does this differ from a computer that would be used to run your bank account or something like that? Well, it was designed specifically for a study of manual intervention where the man can command the computer to take different courses of action while the program is running. And we press the button to command the computer to draw a line. It will draw a line from this position where I am now to any subsequent position of my light pen. This is much like a rubber band stuck in two pins. One is nailed on the, on the screen here and the other is at my light pen. The computer understands the geometry of the drawing here. What do I mean? I mean that if I point at this particular point and tell the computer to move that point by an, another push button command, it will move not only that point, but all three lines that are attached to it. The radial position is the pen, and only looking at its angular position. So I can be very as sloppy as you like, though. Right. Now what I can do is call up copies of master pictures. Remember that picture we drew before. I think it looks oh, something like that. <laughs> That's right. What I've done is I regard that first picture as a master. Magnify it. I can rotate it. And then we place it right there. And I can do this several times. This is, of course, very instrumental for repetitive drawings like circuit diagrams or bridge bays. Well, we have several repetitive structures. In order to correct that mistake, it will go back and let's say I don't really want this circular segment to be in here. I erase it. Now I have the problem of making this, these changes to all the occurrences of this copy in my working drawing. This is very tedious nowadays with pencil and paper. We have to remember where all the changes are. Now you notice, you remember the drawing, that we now have lost our circular arcs. So if a manufacturer, for instance, of some electronic part changed the design somewhere uh, one of these years, you could just automatically change all the drawings in which it appeared. Correct. Here we have a single three-dimensional object as seen from four separate views. We have a top view as indicated by the T here, a front view, and a side view. Oh, this is the way a mechanical drawing would be laid out, and I gather the other one is a perspective. Right, with this addition. Uh -huh. We can rotate this perspective perspective separately from these three views to get an idea of what we have here. Now begin to rotate it. You see it's rotating by an axis perpendicular imaginary floor. We have a wireframe object here with no fabric covering. Hence we see the rearward lines as they come in behind this S which might be lying in the surface. Let's put a roof on this object in this fashion. We'll latch onto that corner and we'll draw a pyramid. I can, <laughs> I can see it from the side view. It's a false front house there. Right. Right. And I can also distort things, move things, like we can in two dimensions. If I latch onto this line here, or let's say this line over here, I can pull that out to the side and distort the object slightly. Now let's see what we've drawn here. We'll rotate the perspective, this view, again. What a strange looking object. And now we have a warped house under construction, perhaps. And there's the F backwards in the perspective. You can construct quite a bit out of these basic shapes. As I move the wedge around in space, you'll see that it goes behind the... Oh, yeah. 
solid and throw it. And the computer figures out where the lines should appear and where they should. Where the intersection is. You get the feeling of three-dimensional space here very dramatically, uh, uh, as though this were a window and a, a, a fore area and a behind area. Right. Now, as this comes out through the other object, you see that it indeed intersects it and can move right through it. And now how I created my logo for our Zeiss Music using Blender. Now, Blender is what's called open source software, and if you don't know what that is, it means that it is entirely free and is only supported by donations and all of the source code and everything is all in one place and you can download it, you can adjust it, you can make it your own. You can even modify it and release your own version of Blender. Nothing is copyrighted, it's all open and open source software is one of the best things about the modern internet, I think. In fact, most of the servers we use today are run on Linux, which is open source software itself. And it's very, very secure because anyone can look at the code and look for flaws and look for errors, not just the engineers that made it. Thousands and thousands of developers can pile through everything that Linux has and see what can be changed, what can be made better, what can be made more secure. There's also audio recording programs like Audacity. There's video encoding things like FFmpeg. Open source software is a huge part of the modern world and I couldn't be happier about it. It's one of the best things I think to have ever happened. But enough about that, let's get into Blender. So. To start things off, I started with the default thing. I deleted the cube, I deleted the light, and I took the camera, I lined it with my view, and now I'm gonna line up the camera so that it's facing perfectly straight down. And I originally forgot how to do this, but then I just ended up um, putting some text into the sidebar uh, just to say, and to make it straight. So I set all the values to zero, and then the camera was pointing perfectly straight down, which is what you need. I also set the camera to orthographic view, which means that everything in the line of the side of the camera is the same distance apart. I also added a big plane down there and made it orange, and then I added a lamp, and I added a sun lamp, and I made the sun lamp. Now, the thing about the sun lamp is it doesn't matter where you put it. It acts as a lamp that's infinitely far away, and you can set the angle of it with that line. You can see I move around. You can set the the size of the sun, you can set the intensity, obviously I set the intensity way too high to start out. Now I'm looking through the camera in a rendered view to see what it looks like and uh, I can switch to material rendered view. Material view is a very basic view but it's very fast to render so you can get work done quickly with that. And now to choose the font. Now I actually couldn't get the font sorted so it took actually a little bit while. I'm gonna skip ahead. So I added the text and I see that the, the font is good. So then I take that background and I adjust the color because the color wasn't quite right. It wasn't what my normal Zeiss logo is. And then I set the text to extrude. So it was completely flat before. Then I set it to extrude and then I set it to rendered mode. And you can see that it casts a very long shadow at the same angle that I put the sun lamp. But you can see it doesn't look at all like my Zeiss Music logo. We still have a ways to go. Now I duplicate it, make the letters nice and small, and then I fail a little bit at selecting the right letter. Uh, for a little bit and then I switch it Z I C E boom and now I have to line it up so that the shadow from the corner of the Z lines up with the E uh, resize it you can see that the ice uh, part of Zeiss is a lot lower so I scale that on the Z axis so that they're all on the same height so they're all lit at the same time so that the ice isn't in the shadow of the Z and now I'm turning all of the light bounces to one because I forgot you needed to do zero instead of one but in a second I'm gonna change them all to zero and what changing it to zero does is it makes it so that it doesn't actually try and bounce the light realistically it just does zero light bounces so as you can see with zero light bounces there's none of the reflection going on none of the light reflects off the white letters it all it just casts a shadow and that's it that's all it does and that's exactly what you want for that modern sort of flat design looking thing I also lower the size of the sun so that the shadows are a lot more sharp and less uh, less sort of faded. With a smaller light source, you get that very nicely. Just the size of the ICE. Try and line it up so that the shadows line up perfectly, which I get, which I then get pretty close. Switch back. Gotta gotta resize it so that it's flat with it again. Change it to rendered mode. Looks good. And now the shadow is way too dark. So what you can do is that uh, you can enable ambient occlusion, which adds a general light to the scene. It just sort of lights up everything. It's like uh, it's like scattered light from the sky that you get in real life. It just sort of lights everything up, and there's no real shadow you get from it. There's no real light source. It comes from everywhere. So you add some brightness there, and it brightens up the shadows. But I'm still not happy with it. It's still, the shadow seems to fade away, and what that means is that my sun angle is a little bit uh, too steep. And because of that, 
you get a little bit of a fade. So I decided to flatten it out a bit, make it a lot less tall, and then I lower the angle of my sun lamp uh, by just a little bit so that it's almost flat. It's just barely there. You can see now it's a lot darker because the angle is a lot less steep. So I have to brighten it up uh, by like a hundred times. And then we get that. We get this very, very nice, very sharp shadow that perfectly drapes across, which I think looks absolutely great. And then I add a little tiny lamp source inside the C and that's way too bright. So I make it a little bit less bright and then increase the size of it so that it fills in the C nicely. And that looks pretty good. Then I change it so it's using my GPU to render because I was using my CPU to render for a good while there and it will render much faster on a graphics card. And I set the samples to 200 and then I go ahead and render it. Render it out of 200 samples. Now for a realistic render, like if you were to model a house and render it, you would need to use a lot more than 200. But for something basic with zero light bounces, 200 is more than enough to make it look good. And as you can see, that's a pretty nice looking thing. Looks pretty good. And that's how I made my Zeiss logo. As you can see, we've come a very, very long way from Sketchpad. Sketchpad was like, it was the it was the first, right? It was the first. I had some 3D aspects to it. It was the first. It was the pioneer. It did it first. And it was, it could do 3D stuff. It could draw lines. It could, it could do wireform. And it could do a basic thing where all the sides were filled in. That was about it. You could model stuff with curves and lines. But the things you can do these days are crazy. So after that, I then took the, my camera and positioned it at an angle and then switched it to perspective view so that it was an orthographic view. So that way it looked like just a normal view. I then lowered the focal length and then I added some depth of field. And uh, I, I, you can adjust the aperture size and the focus distance. After all that, there's really not much else left to do except to uh, give it the old render and uh, see what it looks like. And at 200 samples, it, lo it looks pretty good. But Blender also has lots of modeling tools. It has lots of sculpting tools. Blender is, is a great all-around 3D software if you're looking to get into 3D modeling and texturing and lighting. There's so much you can do with it. Decades ahead of Sketchpad, literally. And uh, yeah, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to leave a like down below and subscribe if you have not already. Now, of course, see you all in the next one. Goodbye.